Um, this is our the Mountain Lion Foundation's monthly webinar series. I'm Josh Rosenau, conservation advocate for the Mountain Lion Foundation. We're a national nonprofit dedicated to ensuring that America's lion sur survives and flourishes in the wild. Our work is funded by individuals who care about mountain lions with members in all 50 states and around the world. And you can become a member at mountainlion.org. On the website, you can also find out how to be an advocate for mountain lions in your community and to policymakers and to learn more about these amazing animals. This month, we're excited to be joined by Bethany Brookshire, author of Pests, How Humans Created Animal, Create Animal Villains, which was published late last year. Brookshire is an award-winning freelance science journalist who writes about human animal conflict, ecology and environmental science, and neuroscience. She's fascinated by the way humans perceive the environment and their place in it. Uh, Brookshire is also the host of the, on the podcast Science for the People. Uh, she has a stub stack called Team Trash, and her work has appeared in Science News, Science News for Students, The Washington Post, New York Times, Slate, The Guardian, The Atlantic, and other outlets. And once upon a time, she and I both blogged on science blogs, hosted by Seed Magazine. Uh, rest in peace. She's based in Washington, D.C., and I'm talking to her from Washington State. Bethany, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So most people don't really like thinking about pests. Can you tell me a little bit about how you decided to write a whole book about them? I mean, to be fair, I'm, I'm definitely one of those people who likes a lot of things that other people don't like. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, there's always that, that little bit of oddity you've got to get in there. Um, but I have been growing my obsession with animals that we hate um, since about, I would say, 2016. Um, I was reporting an article actually for Science News Magazine um, about mice. Um, and it was about the earliest evidence of the house mouse in the Natufian period in um, the area that's now Israel, Palestine, Jordan. Um, and basically in like these earliest evidence of human settlement, they found tiny little mouse teeth um, and they were able to establish that we have had house mice since we had houses. And that was before we had agriculture. We were not farming, we just had houses. And the house mice were able to look at us and be like, that, that looks great. <laughs> um, and I just loved how animals have associated with us um, from the first time that we began to kind of settle in permanent structures. Um, and from there on, I kind of began, the reporting word we use is gathering string on animals and kind of the stories of animals that live with us. And I began to be especially fascinated by why so many people reacted to my obsession with pests so badly. Oh. So like why so many people were like, oh God, I just, I hate those. And so I became really interested in why we label some animals pests, um, no matter what they do. And other animals, we refuse to label pests, even when they do terrible things. Um, and so I ended up writing this book. <laughs> yeah, so, so what, what is a pest? a figment of our imagination, um, <laughs> literally. Um, so a pest, according to like dictionary definitions, um, you could say that it's an animal that causes us what you might call irritation or annoyance. Um, I think of it as it's an animal that doesn't attack us, it attacks our stuff, the things that we value, right? So a cougar, for example, when a cougar is attacking um, a deer in the forest, it is a predator, right? When it is attacking your sheep, it suddenly is a pest. Um, and so I kind of approached it from that um, angle. But as I reported this book and as I learned more and more about human wildlife interactions, it became very clear to me that what pests really are is a reflection of who we are and what we want out of our environments. When we call an animal a pest, what we're saying is they're violating our expectations about what we want our environments to be. Yeah, so a, a pest is is more more in our mind than than necessarily in the animal's behavior. Very much so. Yeah. And one of the one of the things that I kept thinking about, and you you started started talking about this uh, as I was reading the book. Obviously, I I have somewhat of a selective lens that I read things through, and I kept asking myself as as I was. I was looking at sort of the different things that make that that cause us to see different animals as pests 
asking myself, is a mountain lion a pest or, or not? Um, and, uh, you know, obviously some, I, I, not for me, but other people may, may see it differently, but I'm curious, sort of in your, in your reporting, in your conversations, you talk to farmers, uh, the book touches on mountain lions, but more sort of coyotes, wolves, bears, uh, in terms of carnivores. Um, but it, what, what's your, what's your take? Would, would, would you consider mountain lions pests or, or something else? I mean, it really depends. And, and so one of the, um, if we want to get super nerdy for a hot second, um, yes, one of the um, <laughs> one of the reviews papers that I relied on very heavily um, for this book that I just adored, um, it's by Philip Nyhus. Um, it's a 2016 review on human wildlife interactions. Go look it up. Highly recommend. Um, and it includes this wonderful figure. He basically shows us how we divide animals into like different cubes of human judgment. Um, in this in this figure. So basically, you know, a graph has like an X and a Y axis like this. Um, he also inserts a Z axis, so coming out this way. So you end up with kind of this cube and the animals are in different quadrants of the cube. Um, and I actually put this figure in the book because it was just so important to my thinking. Um, but basically what it does is it kind of allows you to place an animal on this kind of graph of judgment based on how rare it is like how rare our encounters with it are, um, how negative that encounter is, right? Um, and the extremity of the encounter, okay? Um, so for example, um, a goose, okay? Goose encounters, they're very, very common. Um, goose encounters are also negative. They're not super negative. They're also very not severe, right? Most people who have a bad encounter with a goose get hissed at. <laughs> um, or uh, sometimes they step in goose poop um, or something like that. And so that would be solidly in this quadrant of the graph that would include animals that we might call pests. And there are also animals that, you know, might cross some of those lines. So you might have animals like, um, oh yeah. <laughs> it's not going to work, no. I don't it's think it's going to work. work. Uh, he's holding up the- it's Worth I, a I shot. Actually. Uh, so it's Philip Nyhus, and I can spell that for you, um, N-Y-H-U-S. And let me find the graph because it's so good. <laughs> and I'm such a nerd for a good graph. Uh, page XV if you need it. Thank you. Do I even know the pages in my own book? Okay. There she is. Um, so yes, that's Philip's graph. Um, and what you can see is that he has a goose right here. <laughs> um, it shows that, you know, the encounters with these animals are very common. They're negative, but they're very minor, right? Um, in comparison to encounters with, say, animals that we would think of as predators, such as cougars, right? The encounters are often very rare, right? Because the animals themselves are relatively rare on the landscape, but also because they don't like humans. Um, so, you know, they're, they're rare. Um, they are sometimes negative, um, and when they are negative, they are severe, right? Um, either because, uh, the animal has taken a whole lamb, um, or, uh, because the animal has, uh, pounced on you on the back of your neck and you are dead now. <laughs> That's a very severe encounter. Um, and so he's able to kind of place animals in these cubes of kind of how humans decide what we think. Um, and so I found it very useful for that because it also shows just how subjective this whole thing is, right? Like this is, this is, these are all subjective measurements. We're judging the encounter to be common or rare. We're judging the encounter to be negative or positive. And we're judging just how severe it is, right? Um, in the book, actually, I recount this time, I got attacked by a turkey while I was reporting the book. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, it was, I would say, relatively common. It was mildly negative in my case because I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, but I talked to a lot of other people who were attacked by that same turkey because this turkey had a rap sheet as long as my arm. Um, and many of them were terrified. Like this was a deeply traumatic experience for them. And that really shows just how subjective these measurements of kind of human wildlife interactions can be. And and with with mountain lions, one of the things that that also happens, you know, there's the the in 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 thinking about that graph, some people encounter them 
there you're a farmer you're a rancher you have goats in your backyard and you're the way that you think about mountain lions the way that you interact with them is through that lens but a lot of one of the big things that's been happening in the last you know decade or so is people are putting doorbell cameras out and they're suddenly seeing mountain lions the yeah. mountain lion was always there it was always walking across their yard but all of a sudden they know that it's there and the a big factor in in people getting like you know calling wildlife agencies or wanting wanting all sorts of reactions um just that proliferation of doorbell cameras the awareness of their presence the sightings um again of animals that were always there that were there before the house was there uh really changes people's thinking about about that wildlife mm -hmm. so you know how why why are people so quick to see that change in in sightings not even the change in numbers as as such a threat that is a complicated question <laughs> um so yeah i actually i dug into this a little bit um in the chapter on coyotes um where i talked about a study um, that a scientist at UCLA did um, using data from Nextdoor, <laughs> um, where people report coyote sightings. Um, but this is absolutely true, um, especially in Colorado, uh, with black bears. Uh, people in Colorado love them some ring doorbells, and those ring doorbells catch a lot of black bears. And all of a sudden, people are, oh my god, there's a bear, you guys. And I'm like, the bear was always, it's been there the whole time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yes, I think in my research and reporting, one of the main things I think that makes people call fish and wildlife, um, for example, um, is often the sense of powerlessness, right? When you know, when you don't know, you're not afraid. Ignorance is bliss, right? When you know, suddenly you're aware there's a giant predator out there that you've never been aware of before. It has been haunting the property that you see as yours, right? Um, and that elicits this feeling of vulnerability and powerlessness. Um, and unfortunately, I have found that for people who are raised in kind of Western industrialized cultures, AKA the global North, um, our response to feelings of vulnerability is often who has a rifle. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, you know, or who has a trap, who can take care of this for me. Um, it's kind of to increase a vice-like grip on landscapes that we perceive to be ours. And I think, I think that's part of it. And I have a whole section um, of the book actually around the theme of power um, and how the animals that challenge our power often end up labeled as pests. And then the, the flip side of that is you, you talk about how situations where people stop seeing animals as pests. Uh, the, the bears or the coyotes can, are an example, but also squirrels, you know, in, in Scotland, just, you know, people going from, from hating them and wanting to wipe them out to finding them a source of national pride. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, I mean, it, you don't have to give advice specifically for mountain lions, but, uh, you know, how, how, do we, how do we shift those perceptions and, and change, change that relationship and change that way of thinking. Uh, you know, what are what are some ways that have worked for that to make yeah, them, make um, an animal not a pest anymore? <laughs> the squirrel example is fascinating in so many ways. Um, I, I love this story. So basically, um, there are red squirrels all over. It's the Eurasian red squirrel, Cyurus niger, um, is the scientific name. It looks like the iconic red squirrel, you know, it's got a little tufted ear, mm -hmm. like a little tail, very cute, um, <laughs> super red. Um, and it's really fascinating because in England and Scotland and Wales, um, the red squirrel for a long time was kind of seen as a pest, um, most particularly because it would get into agricultural areas, it would eat agricultural products. Um, and in the 18th and 19th centuries in particular, it ate bird eggs and the avid Victorian egg collector found this to be a crime of the highest order. I, Brits. Anyway, <laughs> I love you guys. Um, so it was very funny because for a long time, these animals were hunted, poached, run almost to extirpation in many areas. And then <laughs> um, the 
English imported the gray squirrel, uh, which is from the United States. Sayuria squirrel. Our beloved, yes. Yes, our beloved gray squirrel. Um, I call them all Kevin. Uh, and uh, they imported Kevin's. And uh, the gray squirrel turned out to be super successful in the British Isles. Um, and it began taking over red squirrel habitats. And it was so classically xenophobic because all of a sudden <laughs> the British were like, how dare you? <laughs> and now- The British then, didn't like Americans coming and taking over everything? What? We have terrible accents. I mean, it's the only explanation. Um, but yes, so uh, they there have been bounties against the gray squirrel. Um, there are now breeding programs and preservation and all this kind of stuff around the red squirrel. And the red squirrel has become this icon of like Britishness um, in a way, and it, it, this is only over the past like hundred years, um, in a way that's been really fascinating to me. Um, so, and a lot of like, you can see the influences in our subjective values, right? The red squirrel became rare, okay? We could, didn't see it very commonly. Um, the the uh, gray squirrel was giving us kind of uh, things we didn't like. It was taking over, it was too common, right? Um, you were having negative interactions maybe with gray squirrels. Um, and so it's really interesting to see that balance kind of begin to shift um, as people change their perspectives on the animals in their environment. And, and one of the things, unfortunately, that I find to be, I would say the biggest thing to shift the scales is how rare it is. We love a good underdog. We love anything that's dying. <laughs> we, if it's dying out, we are here for it. Um, but when it's really common, we don't care. We're done. Um, and I've noticed that's a very common theme um, that you see. Uh, another good example of this is the fact that Burmese pythons, uh, which are hugely invasive um, in South Florida. I went python hunting for the book and it was amazing, like in so many ways. Uh, and um, they're invasive and they hold these yearly python hunts where they send hunters out into the Everglades to like go catch as many pythons as they can in two weeks. And the answer to how many they can catch is not enough. Um, and it's this really fascinating idea because people just hate them. Burmese pythons are actually in vulnerable. They're vulnerable according to the IUCN red list um, in their native habitat because people have hunted them to extirpation in many areas. Um, and it's really fascinating to see how you really care about the Burmese python when it's rare. Like we really care about it in China, in like Thailand because it's rare there but it's really common in Florida and therefore it needs to die. <laughs> it's there in occasionally, um, you know, someone has a backyard like zoo with a tiger or something, it's, it gets loose and the, the statistic circulates, although I've seen it disputed. Please don't do that, that please that, do not. <laughs> yeah, horrible idea. But the, yeah. the statistic that uh, is that there are more tigers in captivity than there are in the wild. And I, it's, I think you have to slice the numbers in. I don't think we have reliable estimates of how many backyard tigers there are, no. um, but and and there should be fewer now. The there was a law that passed in Congress last year that should should make it harder for that to happen. Um, not not that people are necessarily all committed to following the laws as perfectly as we would like. I was say, but how I think many what tigers do you think are there legally? Is what yeah, I mean it's shocking how few laws, and I mean this also happens with mountain lions. How how few laws some states have like it varies some states have pretty good rules about and regulations and licensing and some you know you might you might need a a license for your dog but not for a tiger which not great i mean so, i think a lot yeah. of it is you know awareness right the vast majority of laws around wildlife in particular in this country are reactive they are not proactive right there's a reason that, for example, you are not allowed to tie a giraffe outside the courthouse, uh, the state courthouse of Florida. There is a law for that. I believe it's Florida. I believe it's a giraffe. I could be wrong about the actual spirit, like species, but that is a reactive law that yeah. was put in place because somebody did that. <laughs> somebody tried it. Florida. Um, and, you know, I think we often don't realize how many of our laws are reactionary in that nature, right? We're not there's not a lot of laws out there about captive tigers because very few of them have 
triggered the passage of such laws. Until one gets loose. Matter of time. Yeah. And I think, you know, to, to the, the squirrel example, it, it, it also reminds me that there's a lot of similarity there with, with P22 in Los Angeles and how, you know, in, in much of the country, if, if there is a mountain lion that's showing up in a city park, they might close the park down, right? It becomes this problem and people get worried about it. And in Los Angeles, it's a holiday, right? It, it became this celebrated citizen. And when in, in that last month before P22 had to be euthanized, uh, you know, there, there were people who it, he attacked some, some chihuahuas that people were out walking. And the owners were just sort of like, yeah, uh, no, I, I didn't see anything. It was just a chihuahua. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't, don't mind me. I'll get another one. That's, that's a cougar. You got to take care of it. It's, it's just such a different reaction. And, and again, regional and, but, but I think but, I mean, because there was know, a story there, right? Where... Those are the same people who, if they saw a coyote, would probably post on next, next door and probably want that coyote removed. Right. And it's, it's the rare versus the common. There's only one P22. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, it, it is even if it was another cougar in their backyard, they might react differently. You're showing up on their Bing camera. They might, they might worry about it in a way that would di be different than, you know, our, in, in, in celebrity obsessed Hollywood. <laughs> yes, that's true. I also think it has a great deal to do with charisma of the animals in question, right? Um, cougars are very charismatic, right? Coyotes, they're kind of doggish. Dogs are pretty charismatic. Like dogs. Is, um, but I, I was also thinking about this with regard to things like bald eagles, right? Um, bald eagles have been proliferating in this country and that's awesome. That's great. We are <laughs> all in favor. Um, you know, and it's really interesting because uh, we have a bunch of bald eagles here in Washington, DC, where I live. And when those bald eagles go to nest, right? They shut down whole areas of parks where those animals are nesting. There are nest camps and there is drama that like, two of the of the bald eagles in the arboretum last year made the news several times due to some amazing relationship drama like that stuff was spicy <laughs> it was it was intense she cheated he ran it was a whole thing anyway um, the real but, eagle iries of washington dc it's so that yes <laughs> um and uh it was really interesting because people react so differently to the proliferation of eagles because eagles eat fish People often forget that bald eagles eat fish. Um, people react very differently when they are looking at different species of hawks that sometimes bring home kittens mm -hmm. to the nest cam. That doesn't go over so good. Um, and I think a lot of the reason that we have this really high tolerance is kind of not just that the, the eagle is rare, but also that it will never bother anything we value, right? And so your tolerance just becomes that much higher. And of course, Ben Franklin famously had his 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 qualms about making the bald eagle the national bird, and and wanted the turkey, and you know, uh, maybe and, and felt like bald, bald eagles were a little bit call. too pesty, right? I, I think it's because he heard the bald eagles call and was like, "That is just not iconic." There's that, yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, when you hear a recorded call um, over a red bald eagle hawk, yeah. flying, you're hearing a red-tailed hawk, not an eagle. <laughs> um, yeah, bald eagles sound kind of they sound kind of like cats. A little bit like they kind of mew. It's a little weird. So a lot of what one of the things that I really appreciated in the the book was that you you a lot of the attitudes that we're talking about here very much pull on this sort of Western settler colonialist, often specifically Christian context. Um, and I appreciated that you also throughout were were presenting the the views of and reactions of, of indigenous populations and peoples from the areas that were, you were writing about in, in the US and around the world. Um, can you, do you wanna talk a little bit about the, what, how, what are those differences? What's, are, are, there, are there ideas that, that we ought to be, uh, you know, hopefully with permission borrowing and, and adapting um, or, or, or just other, you know, other contrasts that you wanna talk about there that, um, that you noticed as you were doing that reporting? Yeah, so I mean, caveats abound. I am not an indigenous person. I do not speak for these people. Um, they are, they contain multitudes. <laughs> um, you know, like the, every 
you know, individual nation or tribe has their own views and their own history and their own knowledge. Um, and that is also not uniform <laughs> across the tribe, right? You know, um, I, I like to say three Jews, five opinions. The same is true for literally every other population. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, um, many of the people who I spoke to who were um, indigenous and talking to me about traditional ecological knowledge or TEK, um, they had a very different perspective from the perspective that you often see in science, honestly, um, in Western settler colonialism, um, in kind of the global North. Um, so it's, it's kind of, it kind of makes more sense to put it in contrast. So when you're from, you know, white Western colonizing, colonizing culture, global North, et cetera, um, we have been taught in many ways to see ourselves as in charge of our environments, as dominating our environments. We've been taught to see the places that we've been taught that there are two places. There are places where people are and there are places where people aren't, right? The wilderness is by definition a place with no people in it. And almost every indigenous person I spoke to about this said that definition made no sense to them. That was not useful. They did not have a concept. Um, and uh, one of them I, I spoke to, he's a, um, I think he's an elder of the, of the, okay, he, white bear clan of the Tuscarora, Neil Patterson. Um, yes, and he was talking to me about language. We had a, a wonderful like three hour conversation on the subject of indigenous language. I, oh, I could nerd out about that forever, it was so great. Um, but what he told me was there were two original words for wolf in their language. Um, there is one that predates European colonial arrival and there's one that postdates it, right? And the one that predates it, um, the translation of the word basically translates to the dog that lives in the forest or the dog that does not live with us. I believe the best translation is the dog that doesn't live with us. Um, Post-colonization, the new word they had for wolf was the dog that lives in the wilderness. Right. So before they had a dog that just doesn't live with us. There are dogs that live with us, and then there are dogs that don't. Um, but after colonization, they knew about this concept of wilderness, this concept of a place where people are not and should not be. Um, and so that definition changed. And I found that really, really fascinating um, and sad uh, because the other thing that I learned from a lot of these indigenous peoples is that they do not see themselves as separated from their environments in the same way that we do, right? Our property is our property and the animals that are on it are the animals we allow. They don't see it that way. They are part of an ecosystem and the animals are part of it too. And when you interact with those animals, you are interacting based on long histories of interacting with those species, right? Um, I talked with, um, several indigenous people who spoke with me about treaties. Um, and basically when I asked them, you know, what do you think of an invasive species or a pest? Um, one of them, I think it was Darren Ranko, um, who's at, I want to say University of Maine. Um, and what he said was um, an invasive species is merely a species that we don't have a treaty with yet, that we don't understand enough to incorporate into our understanding of our ecosystem. And I found that really neat, <laughs> very, yeah. very interesting that they do not see themselves. And in, in many ways, I feel that Western society sees itself in a constant battle with nature. Like we are order against chaos. <laughs> and many indigenous cultures, not all, do not feel that way. And that forms everything that they learn about and think about and how they interact with their environments. Yeah, you write about the sort of the attitude of dominion, the idea that of, of humans trying to control nature as a thing to be controlled and, and sort of dominated as a as a big driving force here. And that, that really, I think, nicely segues to the to the reading that I was going to ask you for. Um, so I'll, I'll I, I want to keep going. I could do this for another hour, but 
we only have so much time slotted here for these for the nice people who joined us. So I won't on on this call at least. We can do that another time. Um, but I, I will tell people we we will throw it open to Q and A later. So think about questions, put them in the chat, and and we'll we'll get to as many as we can. And now, if if you would uh, would favor us with some of the this is uh, from the the final chapter of the book, and I think really touches on a lot of the themes that you were just talking about in terms of people's relationship. What 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 an, a more ideal relationship could be? Yeah, um, and I would like to stress uh, if you're interested in the audiobook version of this book, I had a reader. Her name is Courtney, and she was amazing. <laughs> She's way better than me. So do not take this as like I'm never getting the audiobook because Bethany's reading it. I'm not reading it. Um, <clears throat> But do buy the audiobook. Buy the you can buy the book at your favorite bookstore. Definitely check Please it out. Do. Please buy ten copies. <laughs> All right. None of the ideas in this book are new ones, especially when we take into account indigenous views. Ideas of coexisting with wildlife are thousands of years old. Western science has caught up too. Wildlife managers have, for a long time now, talked about turning conflict into coexistence. The word coexistence conjures up pretty images of people having a picnic under a blue sky in a park while raccoons and deer romp peacefully nearby. The lion lies down with the lamb for good measure. More importantly, the people are doing exactly what they like and the animals are behaving is that exactly as we think they should. If that is what we think coexistence is, we will never ever get there. When I think of coexistence, I think of walking the streets of a city, driving, going grocery shopping, there are so many things that you do without thinking, things that allow you to live in a society with other people. You walk on the sidewalk instead of the street. That's for safety. It's also because if we want the society to work, people need to get where they're going without interference, whether walking, biking, or driving. We behave in pre predictable ways, stopping at stoplights, moving to one side so someone can pass. We wait in line at the store. In exceptionally busy, busy cities, we even give people the courtesy of not seeing them, of walking right past someone walking the other way, giving someone privacy in public. We do this because we don't exist in conflict with other humans most of the time. We coexist with them. There's no one silver bullet here, no one thing that will make all pests or even a single pest leave us alone. Instead, what's needed is a network of changes that acknowledge that animals live with us instead of viewing them as constant interlopers on our world. Society is, at its basis, a set of rules that we all obey that allow for mutual coexistence. If we added animals, some of which we think of as pests, to what we expected to deal with every day, what would it look like? It would look like some different rules, some different ways of behaving. We lock doors against other humans. We get better trash cans and use them and lock our doors against mice, rats, bears, and raccoons, stopping them from getting in. We could provide more people with solid, clean, comfortable places to live. We could give other animals a wider berth and drive slower instead of expecting them to recognize a car going 70 miles an hour. We could keep our dogs on leashes. We could keep our cats inside. We could watch our feet because goose poo happens. We could acknowledge the habitat we create for deer. We could either bring other predators back or add venison to our diets. Pigeons and rabbits linger on in a niche we once appreciated as food. We could appreciate them again. One of the things that allows society to go on in the way that it does is the consistency of our behaviors. When people don't stop at a red light, that is bad. No one supports that. If people cut the line, we've got something to say. Similarly, coexistence with urban wildlife would need consistency. Right now, any animal encountering people from a westernized society faces a potentially deadly roulette. Some will feed them and fawn on them. Some will scream and run the other way. And some will shoot or trap. If we truly want to coexist and not just live near wildlife, our reactions can't be individualistic and about making personal connections. We might have to do the unthinkable. We might have to leave wildlife unfed. That's fantastic. Thanks, thanks, Bethany. That's a, I think, a really great vision of what what wildlife coexistence could be, and and I think a lot of what we what we try to do with the Mountain Lion Foundation is is to help not just help people be safe safe from animals but have be for us to be safe around animals and let them be safe around us you know that's something that you hear wildlife agencies talk about also that you know when when people when you put your trash in the trash can right you're saving a bear's life yes you know it's not it's not just for our own selfish reasons it is it, it's it's a two-way street there and, and a different relationship 
It, it is really reminds of, me. My, some of my greatest moments of pride have been fan letters that I've gotten from readers that have said, I live in bear country and I read your book and I took down my bird feeder. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I did something good today. <laughs> So yeah, let's let's kick this open to to questions. Uh, but yeah, please please do type them in. And uh, there's there's a lot of great stuff in the book. At your your favorite bookstore should have it. It was it was one of the the big books of the last the holiday season. So uh, this is this is a question or a, a comment, I guess, that labeling animals allows for segregation. In addition to pests, we have the label for charismatic animals, usually large or medium and furry. Uh, also an important question that I think I know the answer to, but do you have pet rats? <laughs> I do not. I do not. Uh, the the rat in uh, in my book image is actually my friend's rat. Um, her name is Magrat, R.I.P. Magrat. Um, she passed away. Uh, she was uh, she was older um, and she was actually quite elderly in that photo shoot. Um, but she was just the best rat. She was great. She didn't poop or pee on me the entire photo shoot. It's like three hours. She did really well. Um, I was very surprised, but no, I do not have rats because I have cats. Um, and having cats means that rats would find the entirety of my house very stressful. Um, so I don't do that for them. Um, I'm sorry, what was the, oh, the segregation yeah. idea. Yes, yes, that's very true. Um, and that's something I actually get into in the book. Um, several of my um, sources talked about pest as a word as evoking what they call epistemological violence, which is the world's nerdiest, most unapproachable way of saying, you make it okay to kill it. <laughs> um, like, we, will, we will take anything and make a really unapproachable word out of it. Anyway, um, when you label an animal a pest or an invasive species, as is often happening. Um, or a varmint. Or a varmint. Yep. Um, you make it okay to kill. You make it okay to do whatever is necessary to rid yourself of it. And I think that's a really important takeaway around the concept of what a pest is, because a pest is about what we want to do to an animal. Let's see. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's, there's so much, and I mean, we, some of that is in law, but a lot of it is just the the culture that the way that we in in Texas still classifies mountain lions as a varmint. Mm -hmm. Most of the Western states classify them as game animals, mm -hmm. which allows regulated hunting. But a varmint, you basically shoot on sight. There's almost no no restrictions on what you can do to them. And it really shocks people, but um, that is the classification for feral cats in Australia. You can shoot any feral cat on site in Australia. And when I tell people that often, they are just like floored. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it has a great deal to do with what Australian citizens want out of their environments, how they value their native wildlife um, and what they're willing to do um, to protect their native ecosystems. Yeah, you also talk about in Australia also, but this happens in the, the Southwest. Um, feral horses, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. same sorts of of reaction that people get to the thought that they're, they're, that they're treated as pests on on some landscapes. Yes, and that's really interesting because it also um, there's a whole section uh, that did not make it into the book. So many things didn't make it in, um, but there's a whole section that didn't make it into the book on the um, horses of Assateague mm -hmm. uh, off the Virginia coast um, and uh, how our perception of those animals changes how they are managed right you can't <laughs> those horses do not live in a perfect population on their own <laughs> they do not um and so for example the um the island of Astigue is actually divided halfway between maryland and virginia and they have different methods um hmm. and people are often very shocked to find out that on the maryland side um yeah those ponies get iud's <laughs> not IUDs. They they usually get progesterone shots at this point, but they get they get birth control. Um, and then on the Chincoteague side, on um, the Virginia side, there's the famous pony swim, um, where the uh, horses are swum every year from Assateague to Chincoteague, um, where they are then like evaluated, and the vast majority of foals are sold at auction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's cool. It's this really cool piece of like tidewater history that I really love. Um, 
but it's also a measure of the lengths to which we are willing to go um, to take care of an animal that we care about, right? Um, no one talks about the fact that ho those horses are not native to that island. Um, they have undoubtedly impacted the ecosystem on that island. Nobody cares. Why? Black Beauty. <laughs> And oh no, Miss... not Black Beauty. Misty of Chincoteague. Right. Yeah. My mistake. Misty of Chincoteague. <laughs> I read them all. I swear. <laughs> I read Rats of Nim. Whole deal. This is a it's, a it's a good question. I hadn't thought about this, but is there a difference between a pest and a and vermin? It depends. <laughs> um, the short answer is probably not. Um, <laughs> This is going back to some really early research I did. Um, if you look at the origins of the word pest and the origins of the word vermin. Um, so the origins of the word pest actually refer specifically to disease um, and go back to about the 13th century um, and the 14th century in which you could catch- Pestilence. Pest. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, pestilence, pest, um, P-E-S-T-E -E was the original spelling. Um, and I believe that was Norman French, I want mm -hmm. to say. Um, and vermin was actually more of a kind of an old English Norse term, um, original spelling V-E-R-M-Y-N, um, and usually specifically in old English and middle English contexts referred to animals that were carnivorous. Um, so like uh, mink, so they didn't really have mink, um, but like martens, uh, things like that, those would be vermin. Oh. Um, over time, of course, those have like definitions have shifted and they have basically merged. And now basically any animal that we detest can be either vermin or a pest. And then I, uh, we've got some some people asking, are do do people count as pests? So I've known what, some people, but uh... <laughs> my little brother. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm not kidding. Anyway, um, but um, I would say that's often the conclusion. When I, when I talk about my book, I, I often get people being like, well, the people are pests, that's the problem. And yes, we can be, but I also think that's too easy, right? It's a cop-out. If we say that we are pests, we're throwing up our hands saying, what can we do? We're a scourge upon the planet, right? But we are a pest because of the way we behave and we are adaptable. We have moxie. We are smart. We could be different, right? I think that calling humans pests actually really drives home just how subjective it is, because it shows that with a change in, a beha in behavior, we don't have to be that anymore. Um, so I think in some situations that is absolutely the case, um, but I think we can and probably should be better. Yeah, there's, I underlined a, a passage in the book that where you're, you're talking about this, it's just a couple pages before that section you um, you read for us, where you said, this is this is where you were talking to um, a Lakota author, I believe, Joseph Marshall III. Oh, on behalf I did of not Wilson's actually speak First to him. I did, uh, though I did take a seminar with him. I did not get to interview him. Oh, maybe this is quoting a, a book. Yeah, his book is up there. On behalf of the wolf and the first peoples. <laughs> yes. But where you have, but but be like the wolf, but to be like the wolf meant that they also had to exist to serve the environment, to accept the mutuality of life. Every ha animal had traits that helped them get by in the world. Deers have a strong sense of smell, and skunks have a strong odor. Porcupines have quills. People have reasoning, understanding. In other words, the first peoples did not see their ability to reason or understand as anything that made them superior. It was simply their key to survival. And I think having having that ability also carries with it then responsibility. And we were talking in the in the interview before we were talking about Bill McKibben and the end of nature and this idea <laughs> that right that I mean that and that's what we sort of get to right that we, we can't be pests because we we are in we're controlling in we, we can control ourselves and we can control our circumstances in a way that it's not fair to ask a mountain lion to understand where a state border is or where a park boundary is or where someone's property line is, that this person likes mountain lions and this person hates them. You know, it's it's a it's a, just a different relationship. It's a different thing to ask. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and actually one of the things that I especially appreciated about Joseph Marshall III's book, um, it's excellent, 
highly recommend, um, is something that he said that I thought was really important about wolves um, and about nature in general. Um, it's, he said, you know, coexistence does not always mean that we were pleased with each other, but we expected, we respected each other's right to be, right? And I think that really drove home, like, that there is often this erroneous and rather harmful idea of the noble savage um, around indigenous populations and that they are like one with the ecosystem or whatever. Um, it's not about that. It is about giving the species that you exist with a little more respect and giving yourself a little bit less, right? And respecting their right to exist as being similar to your right to exist. You can still, they can still cause you problems. You can still be annoyed, but the way you deal with a wolf as a neighbor causing you a problem is a very different way than you would deal with a wolf as a pest causing you a problem. And I think that's a really, really important nuance that often gets lost. And this may, this this last question, um, we're, we're gonna wrap up soon, but gets gets to some of those same issues and may, may you may have just answered part of it, but do you have any advice from your interviews, from, from thinking about this, uh, to share with those of us who work in wildlife coexistence on how to engage the public, how to win hearts and minds, how do how do we how do we make some of those those changes in attitude start to happen around us? Uh, first of all, you're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you do great work, and I appreciate you so much. Um, I ah, I think. One of the best takeaways that I saw from the research that I did on this um, is in several, it's, it's research that kind of, it's, it's a message that kind of extends across several papers um, that I was reading, um, most particularly uh, some on bears, um, some on um, coyotes coexistence, um, and some on actually elephant uh, coexistence in Kenya. Um, you see this kind of echoing across when people feel the wildlife they live with has positive value, when they look positively on the wildlife around them, they tend their tolerance really tends to increase. You see, that's a, a pretty good correlation. Um, and it's not just when the animals aren't causing problems, it's when they appreciate seeing them. So for example, when people appreciate seeing black bears in Colorado, they become not only more tolerant, more likely to lock up their trash. <laughs> Um, when people uh, really appreciate and do not fear the presence of coyotes on Cape Breton Island, um, they are more inclined to accept the coexistence and also to, again, lock up their trash. <laughs> um, and, you know, with elephants, when people recognize, you know, what elephants like, it's a much more complicated situation with elephants. We don't have time to go there. Um, but um, they are much more likely to try non-lethal deterrent methods. Um, when they see elephants as part of their culture, which by the way, they universally do. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's about seeing the positives. Um, and a lot of that I think comes from the work that you guys are doing, the education. Um, because the reality is we in Western culture have been separated from our environments for so long that when we confront an animal specifically, it is almost entirely out of ignorance, right? We are acting out of a total lack of knowledge of what that animal's going to do, right? Most of the people I talked to who'd been attacked by a turkey had never seen a wild turkey in their lives. They had no idea what to do. Um, and so they did the wrong thing. Uh, the same is true of bears. The same is true of squirrels, right? Um, and so I think that's the thing is, is educating can help lead to appreciation and appreciation can lead to more education. And I think that can really change the way people interact with their environment. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have so many more things I want to say and uh, follow up on that, but I do think we need to, to cut us off. Thank you so much for joining us. This was great. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to, to continuing this conversation in other ways. This, uh, we're out of time for this session of Living with Lions, but if you enjoyed the conversation, be sure to buy your own copy of Pests at your favorite bookstore, and you can check out Bethany's Substack and her podcast. And when we post this on, on YouTube, there'll be clickable links and uh, 
and I, I think that we went out in the the announcement also for people so you can you can find her there and you can find more of the mountain lion foundation's work on our website and next month on our webcast uh we we've got on the website you can find our youtube channel find past in conversations with other authors and and other people doing this work out in the field uh that's all at mountainlion.org you can also register and join us for next month's living with lions webcast that's going to be june 21st we're going to be joined by our mountain lion advocate and our, our former colleague here at the mountain lion foundation wildlife photographer extraordinaire denise peterson she'll be doing uh caught on camera talk about camera trapping and what we're learning about mountain lions from the cameras that she and others have strategically placed in cougar habitat in utah we might also talk about the current legal status of utah but the the focus is going to be on on the science for sure and then on july 19th you can join us for a conversation about coexisting on a california homestead learning more about how the mountain lion foundation helped the owners of beachfront farms deal with the depredation when they weren't expecting to have to add mountain lions as part of their list of farm chores. So uh, an example of, of mountain lions, hopefully not as pests, and thinking about coexistence. So please join us for that. You can register uh, and, and sign up when, when that comes out, and look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you again, Bethany, for joining us. Thank you to, to all the folks who joined us live and, and anyone watching this later on YouTube. Thank you so much.